seen an episode of TNA Wrestling because when they started out, Russo was with them. And I just, you know, when they first started out, they were on pay-per-view and Russo was with them. And I wasn't going to pay on Wednesday night when we did our TV tapings in OVW. I wasn't going to, you know, pay to tape a show and watch that. But basically, I wasn't going to watch a show that Russo was involved with because why should I make myself mad in my own home, right? And then I just got in the habit of not watching TNA when they got regular television because Russo was still with them. I wasn't going to watch it. And then I heard that he had been fired, and I thought sanity had prevailed. But I still, you know, I was overdosing between watching the OVW shows and, and et cetera, et cetera, and occasionally some WWF. And I wouldn't even truthfully watch most of the WWF program then because then that would make me mad. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think I quit on the necrophilia thing or whatever, you know. Um, but anyway, so I'd never seen TNA, but I told Dutch, I said, Dutch, I burn out on wrestling. You know, I've... Uh, I'm just hanging out at home for a while. I'm doing some Ring of Honor shots. I've never really seen the product. And also, because I had part ownership with OVW and they still had a developmental program, boy, that would probably kind of... And we were still working out a deal with the WWE and OVW over our television rights, which they claimed they own, and which obviously we claimed that we did not, uh, or that they did not own the television program that we paid to produce and air in, uh, in Louisville every week. So I said, I don't want to screw up because we're going to get a big check out of them, and I don't want to screw that up, and also I'm not just going to jump right back in sure. and travel into Florida and everything. I, boy, this has been really long-winded already. So this went on for a number of months. Finally, we got the check, and I got my part of the check, so that hurdle had been cleared. Um, and, but then I, I was doing the thing with Ring of Honor and the Combat Zone wrestling invasion, which was so easy because I just hate it despised, loathe hardcore wrestling and all the goofs that were wrapping themselves up in barbed wire and hitting themselves overhead with fluorescent light tubes. So it was easy to, I would go work a Ring of Honor show every once in a while, vent my true feelings on hardcore wrestling, hardcore wrestlers, and the fans who like the same. I'm sorry, there's something wrong with you. You fucking live downstream from the nuclear plant. If you enjoy watching people take bumps and mouse traps, you're just fucking idiots. And so that was fun. But then finally, you know, Dutch, every once in a while, would call and we'd talk. And I said, all right. And he had the idea and uh, that, uh, you know, I would be the commissioner slash authority figure. He wanted to call it Wrestling Czar, you know, C-Z-A-R, you know, like Ivan Rasputin or something. I can change my name. And, you know, I said, all right, why not? Because I had talked to Jeff also, I guess, finally, when we started talking seriously, I talked to Jeff on the phone. And he said, well, it wouldn't have to be every taping. You could just come down to Florida, you know, shoot the thing and blah, blah, blah. And then, you know, it's not exclusive, so you still do Ring of Honor. Okay, so it started out that I would come down every once in a while and, like, do the pay-per-view. And that's when they only had a one-hour show. So the next day they'd shoot TV and we'd do a couple of TVs. And then I wouldn't have to be there two weeks later, you know, blah, blah, blah. But then I tore my uh, knee up doing <laughs> stupidity WrestleMania weekend. Actually, I took one bump. That's <laughs> all it takes. I took one Was bump. it off the scaffold? And uh, Well, I, I had no ACL in that knee either. And I ended up, I tore some cartilage and my leg got stuck like that, at like that of an angle. And uh, so I had to have surgery on it. And while I was having the surgery, I went ahead and had the ACL reattached, mm -hmm. right? So that meant that I couldn't debut. This was, I did in April. I'd finished my booking, so I walked around on crutches for a month, and then finally had the surgery, I think, in May, and then I was going to debut in June. Don't hold me to that, but that's approximately it. So anyway, ended up, had a surgery. It wasn't, I was doing a physical therapy, but it still wasn't straightening out because it, it had been bent so long. So... They had to take me and put me to sleep and straighten it out manually. They oh, break wow. the scar tissue loose, right? Well, That's I'm asleep. Wonderful. I don't know about yeah. it, but when I wake up, boy, what a feeling that is. <laughs> the first time, because I'd been putting weight on it, right? First time you're going to put weight on it, it's like your leg isn't even there. It just feels, wow. So, so I'm still walking with a cane, and I finally I go down and I make my glorious debut with TNA Wrestling on pay-per-view, and I've got the cane and all day long. Because I've been bored, right? So I'm doing, doing a Charlie Chaplin thing with the cane, right? I'm, I'm building up to a story. I'm doing a bit. So okay. thank you for, you know. But please jump in to move it along whenever you don't be intimidated. Because no, I could take an thank hour you. and a half to watch 60 minutes. So anyway, spinning. I'm spinning the cane. So when I go out, nobody knows I'm there. Of course, it's a surprise. I get a pretty decent pop, right? So I'm going to milk this because I, I looked. I've got to walk down this ramp. Now, bear in mind, I've only had the legs straightened out like literally three days beforehand. 
So now I got to walk down that ramp and I was going to do it slow anyway, right? So while they're popping, I start spinning the cane. That's 110 degrees in Orlando. It's 120 in the impact zone. The lights, the sweat. I spin the cane. <laughs> the cane goes that way. And you look, if you look and you can see the look on my face, they're like, <laughs> oh shit! And my wife, even Stacy, was like, "Did you mean to do that afterwards?" I'm like, "No, I thought I was going to look over there and see some woman with the cane <laughs> stuck in her chest, right?" So now I got to get down this ramp to the ring for this big promo I'm supposed to do <laughs> with no cane. It's the first time I've walked without a cane in three months. So you see, I grip my teeth and flat-footed, I made it down there, right? And I get up, and once I get in the ring, I'm okay. I said, "I don't need no stinking cane." And cut the promo, I'm there, I'm the new authority figure, manage what, whatever they ended mm -hmm. up deciding to call me. And that was, and, and that was, except for the, you know, kerfluffle with the, the cane, that was, it was fun. And Jeff Jarrett, I got a chance to, you know, see him after so long. Mm -hmm. And I'd known Keith Mitchell, the, the producer, since back in the world class days in sure. Dallas. And Dave Sahadi, the director, was from the... WWE and his father, Lou Sahadi, actually was the editor of Wrestling World magazine back really? in the 60s. Oh, yes, that, that. Awesome. they are related. Um, you know, got a chance to see a bunch of you know, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles from Ring of Honor, Christopher Daniels, plus guys that I'd you know, known previously, blah, 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 everything. Love and love is in the air. I'm waiting for a particular name to come up. You've mentioned Jeff, you've mentioned Dutch, and of course, yes. anyone thinks TNA and they think management. Your first impressions of Dixie Carter? Didn't meet Dixie. I don't think, I'm trying to think how long it was, because then I, you know, as I started going, I, I was going so much, but I didn't meet Dixie that day. I don't know if she was there. I didn't meet her or whatever. Mm. I came in late because I was a surprise, but but the, the first time I met Dixie, anyway, the, we did the pay-per-view, we did the TV, blah, 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 everything's great. I even cut the promo because the reason why I wanted to work there, obviously, A, there were several reasons. Number one, competition of Vince McMahon. So there's not a monopoly. Somebody somewhere has, has, you know, has given you some competition. Number two, they got a, a great talent roster at the time, a lot of great guys. Number three, obviously, not only do I want to work with Dutch, just because that way he entertained me, but also <laughs> Jeff Jarrett, I even cut the promo that night on the pay-per-view because Jeff was a heel then, and I said, Jeff Jarrett, I looked at the camera, I said, Jeff Jarrett, I knew your grandmother. She was a wonderful woman, and she'd be turning over in her grave, spinning in her grave right now if she knew what a no-good son of a gun you've turned out to be, right? And it was heavy, right? Because her, his grandmother did start me in, in the wrestling business, and his father, you know, carried that on. So that was great, and then I get, you asked the question the first time I met Dixie. This was probably a harbinger of things to come. The first time I met Dixie was probably a couple of times later, because I remember I made that shot, and then I wasn't there the next taping, and then, you know, because I had previous commitments. I had finished the thing up with Ring of Honor, that angle, which we did that in July. That conflicted with their taping. And then I was back in August, um, and it might have been then, but there's this job guy that used to work for Les Thatcher. And I can't even remember what his name now is. Nobody else can either. It doesn't matter. But I remembered him from working for Les Thatcher in Cincinnati, the HWA. And he was there because he had moved to Florida, and he was there backstage. And uh, he, he said hello to me, and I looked at his face. I said, hey, and whatever your name is. I said, hey, how you doing? I went to shake his hand. The backstory on this that I did not know was he was trying to get a job because now his real job in Florida was he was an exterminator, like bugs and rats and pests and things. Rats. And he wanted to make a gimmick out of that. Well, they, <laughs> believe me, the wrestling business exterminated all the rats a long time ago before, you know, you didn't have to gas them. You just ran them off because nobody was servicing them. <laughs> but anyway, he was an exterminator and he was going to make his gimmick an exterminator. And as I go to shake his hand, he holds his hand out, and he has a legitimate, giant, live, living fucking tarantula mm, in his hand. Mm -hmm. I don't coexist with spiders. I don't coexist with snakes. My name is not Jim Stafford, but I don't like spiders and snakes, and I don't care what it takes. No. And I got hot. You fucking idiot. What the fuck? And I jumped back and he starts smiling. And I said, motherfucker, don't fucking smile. I'll go get in my goddamn car and run you the fuck down. You get that fucking thing away from me and you stay far away from me as you possibly can. What kind of fucking idiot brings a goddamn... It was bigger than his hand. A live tarantula and just fucking sticks it in people's faces. Fuck him. And I don't remember your name, but fuck you, you know, if you see this ever today. If you're still alive, if you haven't been bitten by a poisonous fucking spider. <laughs> 
So I fucking go in the, you know, the back, well, you, I don't know if you've been there, but they, you have to leave the sound stage. you come through the outside area, even though it's covered up, it's outside, and then you go in the hallway where the offices are, and I see Terry Taylor, my other old friend Terry Taylor, who was working in the office at the time, and he's talking to some woman. And I said, Terry, this fucking job guy out there has got a fucking tarantula. I'm going to fucking kill him. He stuck a live tarantula in my fucking face. and That's bullshit. We need to run him off the goddamn property because what the fuck? And Terry said, hi, Jim, meet Dixie Carter. Hey, hey, okay. hey okay. Dixie, how you doing? It's good, good to meet you. So maybe that was, you know, a harbinger of things to come. But that's how I met Dixie Carter. Okay, and impressions? Um, no, really, do well, your impression. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, well, <laughs> um... Actually, that's, we obviously didn't have a conversation then, and it was a while, you know, my thing was, well, I, I guess I should back up and, and say, of course, then the following month is when they made another hire that, that you know, I don't want to get into a whole thing, but the following month's when they hired Dickhead Russo. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> Dickhead can be anyone in this well, business. Well, no, there, there were really, it was a nice bunch of people there, except for the one at that time. Um... That was the conversation I had with Dixie Carter at that point, and that she wasn't there all the time at all the TVs. And when she was, actually, after she hired, after they hired Russo, this is where I was going with this, I never had an in depth conversation with Dixie Carter hmm. because I wanted to stay away from Dixie Carter because I knew that. <sighs> I could talk to Jeff, I could talk to Dutch, I could talk to Keith, I could talk to Dave Sahadi, I can talk to the boys. Sometimes civilians outside the wrestling business, A, don't know how to take me, and B, truthfully, once that they hired Russo, and we can go through the brief story of my reaction, and then I'm not going to fucking just beat him with a claw hammer to verbally, um, <laughs> I don't want to be the one to smarten her up and say, look, you're fucking doomed, ah, okay. right? Because okay. she's going to ask me my opinion. I can't mm -hmm. lie. I can't say, oh, I think everything's lovely and I think you're doing things the right way and et cetera. I would, so since I couldn't lie and I didn't want to tell her the truth, then I thought, well, I'll be the one. <laughs> After I get finished telling her what I really think, she'll close the whole company down, throw everybody out of a job, and it'll be my fault. So I always... Okay. She, why, why would I have a conversation with her? Truthfully, because she didn't know anything about wrestling. I didn't know anything about her. I was pleasant to her when we when we saw each other. Hi, Dixie. How are you? All good. Blah blah blah. We talk about the weather, or whatever. But having an in, in depth conversation, it was like I used to tell Danny Davis when the writers would come down from the WWE. I either need five minutes or five years because anything in between ain't going to do both of us any good. Because she, what the fuck could we talk about? I would tell her the truth about what I thought was going on in her company and who was responsible for it and the good or the bad, and she might get hot, and then yeah. we'd get sideways or whatever, and, or she's not going to retain it because, you know, if, if I'm talking about wrestling, I'm speaking Greek. So we were always pleasant and cordial, mm. but we never sat down and had any in-depth conversations. Now, you'd see the guys, when I'd, when I'd go back to the Doubletree, I'd either get room service or elsewise I'd have a bag of Wendy's, and I'd see all the guys in the bar down there, and they'd all be sitting next to her, pouring her wine and everything, and telling her how great she was oh, and how great they were. Okay. And I'm sure they had some wonderful conversations about the way wrestling ought to be conducted, but I, I was not in on those. So to answer your question, Dixie... Okay. She's an attractive, looks good for her age, you know, well-spoken person who was always pleasant, and we never had a crossword up until the end. People that you did have a great rapport with throughout your career, one of those names that comes to mind would be Jeff Jarrett. Yes. Did Jeff change at all based on his status within TNA, in your mind? <clears throat> <laughs> well, he had, he had changed since the last time I'd been around him because it had been 10 years. So people change in 10 years, but I don't, I would say that he changed because of his status. I, something happened. Jeff has, uh, he's a great worker. He's got a good mind for the wrestling business. Uh, he has the bloodlines, of course. Something happened. It's it's like I view people who I, I otherwise think are sane, rational, reasonable people who are religious. There's something in there that just doesn't compute with the rest of, of, of the person. I don't know how that, you know, otherwise intelligent, sane, rational people can believe in the invisible man in the sky and supreme being and heaven and hell and all the things, et cetera, et cetera. 
Jeff Jarrett's spot was, for some reason, he thought Vince Russo would be a benefit to his fucking wrestling company. And for some reason, he, he's found out differently now, you know, with Dutch trying to tell him too. But and we'll get on to that. I, I told Jeff one time, I, I know I told, I told Dutch, I said, tell Jeff when you talk to him, good rib, three years, right? Just to get me to fucking shake hands with the guy, and then it was over. But that's the only thing, that's the only criticism I have of Jeff Jarrett to this day is that he somehow thought that Vince Russo was a benefit to the wrestling business. Okay. And, uh, you know, otherwise than that, I think, you know, he was trying to do a good job. And nobody's ever going to agree with the booker or the owner or the boss or whatever, 100%. But, you know, that's the only, <laughs> the only problem I have with Jeff Jarrett was that he liked and or thought that Vince Russo was a benefit to the wrestling business and that he put me in the same fucking place at the same time with him. Your ability to see things down the road is well documented. You've been called a luminary, a visionary, amongst other things that you've been called yeah, both man, to your man. face and behind yeah, your back. Yeah, exactly. Did you truly feel, with your third eye, that TNA was going to change the landscape of the industry? Did you truly believe that? No, I, I never thought they were going to change the landscape of the industry. I thought they were going to make money and provide an alternative for, for another place for guys to work. And... W w Nobody, and even at that point, this was 2006, it's now 2013, to me, in the wrestling business, nobody is ever going to have that much television, that wide, wide reach of television, that kind of production, that kind of talent roster, that kind of chance to challenge Vince McMahon again. It just, it's not going to happen again. Not in our lifetime, and you're younger than me. So I thought, okay, this company, they, they are on Spike TV. They have a tremendous production crew. They have a great talent roster. They, they have, obviously, money, not Vince's money, but money right. behind them. This is the best chance we got. So I'm going to throw myself into this, as I always do, the OCD in me. I'm going to, upset, I'm going to throw myself into this, and I'm going to do my dead-level best to make this as good as it can be, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting at home one day, and Dutch calls <laughs> me, right? Smart. And it was September, and Dutch calls me. And he, I answered the phone, he said, Jimmy, we made some changes in the, I can't do Dutch, but you can imagine. Jimmy, we made some changes in the, in the creative team. I said, okay. He said, we fired everybody but me and, and Jeff. I said, well, there, there's a start for you. That's good, because I'm not knocking anybody else that was involved with it, but when you've got a bunch of, a room full of people, you've got a room full, it's a Tower of Babel. It's just everybody mm -hmm. nattering. Right, you need a guy and a guy helping the guy, and that's what you need to book wrestling. He said, "We hired one guy." I said, "Who's that?" He said, "Vince Russo." And <laughs> see this face, please, <laughs> cameraman, pull back because I actually did this accidentally. I can't do it again, you know. But that was the face. What? What? I said, "What?" The re one of the reasons why I had agreed to come to work for the company was I thought that I was safe because he'd already been there and been fired. And I, so I thought, okay, we've got past that, and mm -hmm. I'll, you know, and I was, I was dumbfounded, actually speechless, Jim Cornette, for a minute. And he said, <laughs> well, and I can't remember what he said, because I was, I was in shock. I was like, PTSD. Was, and I said, tell, tell Jeff to call me, right? So Jeff, and Jeff don't call you very often. I've worked for him for three years. I think he called me on the phone like five times. We'd see each other, but, you know, he doesn't call. But I said, he called me either that day or the next day. And I'm watching the little pond in my neighbor's backyard. His big black dog's jumping around in the pond. And he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm watching this dog jump around in this pond and trying to figure out what the fuck you're doing. <laughs> And he said, well, and you know, it's, it's not, and then the other thing. And he tried to sell me, you know, he's, he, we'll keep an eye on him. He's got different ideas. I said, yeah, he, sure, he has different ideas, all right. I said, this ain't going to be good for business, me and him in the same place. Uh, you know, and, well, no, no, it'll worry, blah, blah, blah. He, you know, and Jeff had, he's almost got Jerry's silver tongue. You know, Jerry could say the glass is on your own face, as Teeny used to say. Um... So I said, we'll, we'll talk about it when, when I get down there, because the next taping was a week or two later. So I got down there, and I'd already decided. I sat down with Jeff, sat down with Dutch. I said, look, I said, this ain't going to work, obviously. 
I hate him. I'm sure he, if he doesn't hate me, he's. I found out later he's scared of me because Jeff yelled at him for being scared of me. He said when the Dutch was listening outside one time when Jeff and Vince were having a fucking back and forth in the room, and Jeff finally blew up and said, why don't you goddamn just have the fucking fight then and see what happens, right? But anyway, I sat down with him. I said, look, it ain't going to be good for business. It's going to detract from business. I just started. I said, if, if you're set on having him here, let me give my notice. I'll bow out gracefully. Um, I think I was, Abyss at the time was a heel. I said, put some on TV. Abyss to get some heat can give me the black hole slam or whatever, and I'll be carried off on a stretcher and a spatula or whatever because it's coming up on... I guess that was about October time by that point. We were coming up on Bound for Glory, and I figured, in, in the back of my mind, I thought sanity will prevail, and they will fire him again. And you do be... realize it's the wrestling business, right? Sanity well, but, never prevails. But still, see, I, I, was, I, was, I was smoking the hopium. <laughs> oh, boy. I thought sanity will prevail, and they'll fire him after Christmas or whatever. And, and, and I, I think I even said, I said, probably he'll probably be done by after Christmas. And then if you want me to, I'll come back. But I, I don't want to be in the same place at the same time. It's going to be bad for business. It'll detract. Hmm. I'll work my notice by taking the deal just whenever the fuck. Were there any counter incentives offered? Hey, why don't you stay? And if you do, we'll give you this, this, and this. Was that ever? No. Uh, well, because at the time I wasn't even full time. I was okay. just coming down when they wanted me to to do the deal when they had me written on television. And because I told them I didn't want to drive down to Orlando twice a month. Um, might have been. Was it once a month? No, twice a month. Yeah, and they do two TV. But it was just a one day of TV. Anyway, I digress. Point is, uh, maybe Russo's up there now. Anyway, um, Jeff wouldn't take the notice. He said, no. He said, Corny, I'm not going to take your notice. If you don't come back, it means that you're no-showing. And, and he knows, mm -hmm. now he's getting me my old-fashionedness, yeah, sure. right? Don't work opposition. Mm -hmm. Don't no-show. I said, oh, come on. He said, and, and he silver-tongued it. I, he said, you won't have to talk to him. You won't have to. Do, Dutch is your agent. A, as a talent, you won't have to speak to him. You won't have any interaction with him. Okay. Didn't want to be the, you know, I'm not a quitter. Didn't want to be the quitter. God damn, mm -hmm. all right. So we coexisted for a couple months, although at, at Bound for Glory, which I think was in St. Louis that year, I was sick with a, that was when Kurt Angle debuted, right? I'm horribly sick with the flu. I ended up losing my voice. I g actually went to the bar the night beforehand and had a couple drinks trying to loosen my voice up. And of course, that just made me think it matters. So I ended up. Jesus Christ, this is a closed set. <laughs> they just The cameraman, ladies and gentlemen, the cameraman yeah, has just, just walked just off. Now. The producer <laughs> just walked off. We're literally in an empty room now. <laughs> this um, is where it gets good. I ended up, said some, one of the boys stirred me up, and I ended up the next day when I got in the elevator, I saw a bloody spot of where I'd pinned my knuckles, where I'd good punched the wall thinking, that fucking Russo, fucking Russo, fucking Russo, right? So anyway, I can't speak. I introduce Kurt Angle. I say one line because I'm, I'm sick, but I wouldn't miss this or anything, blah, blah, blah. And then anyway, it was in December. Jeff said, come, come down early. I want to talk to you. So in December, Jeff made me the offer, look, how about in addition to being the management figure, whatever they called me, um, you be an agent because we need wrestling minds. We did Dutch needs help. We need somebody to lay the matches out. You, you know, you already know Keith, David. You can work with the TV truck. You got plenty of experience. Blah blah blah. We're sitting having sushi, and I said, "Okay." I said, "I'll do it." And of course, there was more money involved, but also I would have to come, you know, to every taping. I said, "I'll do it," because at that point, I thought, "Okay." I said I wanted to give everything I had to TNA wrestling. And now it's like they're being infiltrated from within by the evil communist forces. Maybe there's something I can do to, as bad as Russo fucks it up, at least if I work hard, maybe I can balance it out where they've at least got an even playing okay. field and, and things will be not better, but at least not worse. Maybe I can, just, once again, wrestling will make you crazy. This is what I, can, I was thinking. Some way or another, I can counteract the negative influence that he will have on the product by being so good on, on the other side as a positive influence that we'll balance each other out. And? 
Well, did that happen? No. No. <laughs> was there one thing in particular that you can recall that maybe someone offered up as an idea, and in your mind you went, that makes no sense at all, and, and there became this clash oh, of ideas? Yeah, every time that, that – every production meeting. Right. It was every production meeting because – and and maybe I'd, I'd almost I guess I shot myself in the foot because when you? Dutch well when Dutch was originally talking to me about coming in the, before the Russo thing he's like I said I, Dutch I don't want to book any more wrestling I've been booking OVW by myself six years in a fucking row uh -huh. uh, through hernia sur I missed I missed six weeks of TV in six years two weeks from hernia surgery uh, two or three weeks when my mom passed away. And one week when I had we had a pipe burst in my house, we had a fucking flood. All right, okay. So six weeks and three years, and and with the hernia surgery, I hobbled in with fourteen surgical staples in my crotch, and only actually only missed one TV, but missed several on the air. But I was back mm -hmm. in the back for the other one. Anyway, so I take the job as agent, and. That was great. I liked working with the guys, especially the young guys. Bobby Roode, I was a huge fan of. I mean, sure. you know, just tremendously. And him and Storm were, were yeah. great as a team. And, you know, I don't want to mention everybody. Then if I leave somebody out, they'll think, well, he didn't like me. But, no, I like almost all the guys, I thought, you know, had something going on for them. And, but the thing is, then I'd come to the production meetings, right? And... The way it was set up, everybody in the office, all the agents, uh, Jeff, uh, uh, the announcers, by Don West and Mike Tanay. Mike Tanay, I'd known since the 80s when he lived in Vegas. I give Jesus Christ, there's a bus station in here. People just come and go at all I hang hours. out at bus stations. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard that about you. Yeah. Um, so anyway, Don West, <laughs> it reminded me to tell you the story the first time I met Don West, but okay. we'll, we'll get off on a tangent here. But... Anyway, we'd all sit in the production meeting room, and Mike Tanay would read the format. The format that basically Dutch and Jeff and Russo had agreed on, but that Russo primarily is the one who would sit there and type it out and everything. So Mike, re and it made it even worse because Mike would read it in a non-judgmental voice. Non he wouldn't roll his eyes. He wouldn't, he wouldn't really get into it. But he wouldn't really scoff at it. He would just read like a monotone reading of it, whatever was there. It could be, you know, good, bad, or indifferent. He would read it the same way. So I'd be sitting across from Keith Mitchell. And when it got to this, just the real stupid shit that Russo insisted on putting in. And I'll give you a few examples here in a minute. But every week, I mean, I wish I'd have brought my TNA formats and I could read them to you. But I'd look over at Keith Mitchell, and he, and from a production standpoint, he'd be going, how the fuck are we going to shoot this? Because remember, Russo's the guy one time in WCW called him on Friday and said, we need a Partridge family bus on Monday in Boston. You know, like, gee, you can just, okay, we'll go to the Partridge family bus store. Sure. So Keith Mitchell would be rolling his eyes, right? Like, oh, geez, how are we going to shoot this? And David Sahadi has not, never said a bad word about anybody, so he'd kind of be there, but and Don West would be, you know, fiddling around, and and I'd look at Mike, and every once in a while I could almost get Mike Tanay to, to, to bust, because I'd, I'd give him that sideways look like, you know this is fucking horse shit, right? But he wouldn't. He, he, was, he was a pro. And I would sit there, and just what he was doing to the fucking show, to the credibility of the show. What, one time in particular, the first time I was going to quit, just get in the car and go home, so that's why I never go anywhere without a car and, and keys in my that's pocket. Right. Where I can, I can I leave, leave anytime, anytime I'm somewhere. Yes, I can leave and go that's home whenever I want. Great advice for anyone. I was going to, as Jim Cornette, as the on-air commissioner, was going to make a tag team match. Rick and Scott, the Steiner brothers, versus Kurt Angle and his fucking wife, Karen. And I was going to go, and there was some reason for this written down that I was going to make this fucking match. And so I didn't say anything about it during a production meeting. But I waited till afterwards. I told Keith Mitchell, I said, well, I'm going to go get the truck. And, you know, it's thanks. It's been nice working. No, don't do that. Go to, I said, all right. So what I did was I went to Wendy's, had two triple cheeseburgers and thought about it and came back and went to Jeff and said, okay, now what can we do that I'll do? Cause I, elsewise I'm going home. I'm not going to make a match between the Steiner brothers and Kurt Angle and his wife. How could I fucking feasibly? <laughs> So we ended up being a handicap match. I don't know what the fuck. It was constantly trying to fix somebody else's shit. Like, you start the murder mystery. You write the first chapter, and then you hand it to me. Okay. You write the rest of it. <laughs> Who did it? I don't know. Fixing shit is worse than taking a, a blank piece of paper and, yes. and starting from scratch, right? And, and in the production meetings, I would ask 
pertinent questions that I needed to know as an agent or that I knew that, that Keith Mitchell as the producer needed to know or the director needed to know or that the, the other agents, if it was somebody needed to know, such as when did the bell ring to start the match? Because one time he had a, a match actually with a finish, but it never started. And I said, the first thing that the guys are going to ask me is, the match never started, so how can it be over? Oh, nobody will notice, right? First thing the guys ask me, well, how, how can the match have a finish? We never started the match. Uh. So I'd ask these questions, because it's a fucking television program. We need to know these things. <laughs> he wasn't prepared. To, he's like the Republicans. He wasn't prepared to answer those questions that, that were asked that anybody in their right mind would fucking ask, because he Do thought it. Do you think he wrote them with an intent to put you in an awkward position? No, no. he wrote them because he's a fucking idiot, and he okay. don't know how to write any better wrestling than what he wrote. Well, I mean, no, it wasn't like it was on purpose. He was really that fucking fucked in the head as far as wrestling. <laughs> the one, and it, I didn't even know we were going to go off on this, this line of commentary. And I, <laughs> I promise, folks, this will not all be about Vince Russo, but he's asking me the questions, and I'm trying to answer them to the best of my ability. My favorite one. Yes. My favorite one was when Abyss was being psychoanalyzed by Dr. Stevie Richards. <laughs> okay, now, folks, we are being led to believe. And this would just, that's what, after a while, I'm, I must admit, you know, that was the end of 2006. By, by fall of 2009, I had mentally tuned out. I'd mentally tuned out a long time before that. But because it just, it wasn't going to get any better. It was only going to get worse. Then they started bringing in everybody that they could sign that had ever worked for Vince for all the money. And meanwhile, the guys that were doing all the work were getting paid nothing. While the top I'd like guys to get your thoughts you know, on that when you Well, I got a few. I'm sure. Uh, but the so so suddenly somehow Stevie Richards that everybody's seen on television as a wrestler for fucking years and years is a doctor is a doctor, yes. and not only that but in the impact zone he has an office with a secretary <laughs> with a receptionist and he's a fucking psychiatrist and Abyss who's another fucking I love I love the person behind Abyss and I love the gimmick of Abyss. I haven't seen Joseph Park because I don't watch it. I've, I read on the internet every few days who's hired, who's fired, and who's made an ass out of themselves, but I don't watch wrestling anymore. <laughs> At some point, all but, of those were me. Yeah, well, I know. I know. <laughs> Especially the last one. Um, but so anyway, so Abyss goes into Dr. Stevie's receptionist's office and he's waiting to see the fucking doctor. <laughs> And the receptionist gives him a cup of coffee, and Mike Tanay is having to read this, right? Because he would, he would write out the pre-tapes, like everything that he thought the guys were going to say. Of course, the guys that could talk would change it, because they didn't want to say this stupid shit. And the guys that couldn't talk or didn't have the pull to change it would try to memorize it. That's why they'd have that deer caught in the headlights look, because they're trying to recite the words that they have memorized that have been written by a fucking idiot. So anyway, he gets a cup of coffee, he's sitting there, Doc Stevens says, come on in, he gets on the couch, and Mike Tanay is reading this. And here was the embarrassing thing. The embarrassing thing always to me was Scott Fishman, who was a direct, uh, not a director, but uh, one of the executive producers, one of Spike TV personnel. Okay. You, you would see his name at the end of the UFC programs when UFC was on Spike. He was, in, he was the guy that would come from Spike to oversee the TNA programming and the UFC programming to make sure that none of these people did anything to get them, sure. you know, get their license pulled or kicked off the air or whatever. And he would be sitting in the production meetings. And I just knew he was going back to the UFC, to the real sport, to what they really cared about. And he was saying in the production meetings, this fucking idiot that writes this fucking wrestling show can't even spell because words were misspelled. And... And shit was wrong because they didn't change it in the computer, and and the, just the stupid things that he has these guys say and do. It was embarrassing. I'd look over at him every once in a while when something was really outrageously stupid, and he just he you know he's just waiting to go play golf and he'll come back for the taping, right? So anyway, Doctor Stevie's talking to Abyss, and suddenly he says, "Oh Abyss, I see that the blank has taken effect already." You see, it's what I put in the coffee that my receptionist gave you because it paralyzes your nervous system. You're still breathing. You're still conscious. You can hear every word I say. You know what's going on around you, but you can't move a muscle, Abyss. 
Where do I fucking start? Not only was that the goddamn stupidest thing I've ever heard of, but it actually on the format said the blank has taken effect. Like there was really some kind of this goddamn pygmy curare poison from the wilds of the Amazon that you could get that would have this effect, but he couldn't be bothered to get on the internet and search out what the name of it was, so he just left it blank like somebody else was going to know. Oh, you mean the draconian poisoning? Oh, yeah, that's what it was. He left it fucking blank to come up with a name for this fictitious fucking poison. I was, oh, I was, I've saved that format especially on, it's sitting on, on the shelf in my office as, as when I finally said wrestling is, is, you know, fucking pretty much done with this kind of shit like this going on. But anyway, and they shot that thing. Nobody, there's Jeff Jarrett sitting there, part owner of the company, his father started it. Dixie Carter may very well have been. Sometimes she was in a production meeting. Sometimes she wasn't. Sometimes she was at the taping. Sometimes she wasn't. Sometimes she would come and she'd get in the, in the makeup chair. As a matter of fact, one time she called one of the production assistants because her plane was running late. And she said, make sure that, because they had a makeup area for all the knockouts, right? Make sure the chair is open at 6.30 because my plane is late and i got to get my makeup done. And she came and knocked all the knockouts, no pun intended, out of the makeup chair so that the makeup girl could sit there and do her makeup so that she could go out before the taping started carrying the world title belt and take pictures with the fans. She wasn't even on the show. Huh. <sighs> the little southern princess. But anyway, everybody, Mike Tanay's reading this. Jeff Jarrett is sitting there. Fucking grown men, and nobody just stood up and just back fucking handed Vince Russo and said, You fucking idiot, what are you doing to our company? Why do you think that was? I don't know! <laughs> That's what made me crazy. And finally, as, as it just went on, and I promise this is coming to an end, as it went on and on, and I would go, and I could see, you know, the guys, especially the WWE guys. They that that had names to protect and reputations to protect, whether they were given their all like a Kurt Angle or whether they were just taking a paycheck like a few of the other people. And I'll tell you, I like Booker T, but God, he was a pain in the ass because he didn't want to do anything because it was all stupid. And yes, and I would sit with him. I say, yes, I understand, guys. You don't want to do this because it is stupid. But they got something down here on paper. So can we get to where they need to be? Can you give me something that I can then go to Jeff Jarrett and talk to about? Instead of just saying, no, it, it sucks. Figure something else out. Let's work it out, right? So it was a concept I would take because usually they had me working with the top guys. And then the other agents, whether it be Savio Vega was, was a good agent, uh, Road Dog, Brian Armstrong. Um, uh, Demore was an agent for a while, and he quit and went home to Canada. He couldn't take it anymore. Um, Disco Inferno got a favor job uh, from Russo, you know, and the boys didn't respect him. The Steiner brothers one time took him down, pulled his pants off, and duct taped his arms and fucking legs behind him and gravel marked him and everything in the parking lot. He was an idiot. <laughs> he actually wanted to have an evil architect named Bill Ding. <laughs> and all that shit. So, you know, I'm sorry, Disco Inferno. Once again, he was an entertaining person, but I know a lot of entertaining people that I wouldn't let sure. handle my wrestling program. But anyway, so I would have to work with the guys. I'd have to take, the, if it was the main event of the show, six-man tag, whatever, I'd have six guys in a room, and some of them weren't motivated to get there on time. But some of them, were, you know, would, Samoa Joe always wanted to be there and find out what was going on, or AJ Styles always wanted to be there. And Kurt Angle, God, you know, Jesus Christ, he'll 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 yes. work two years after he's dead. Sure. Never seen a, a drive and determination like that. And some of the other ones were lazy asses and didn't want to fucking talk about it or didn't want to be there on time or whatever. So not only did I have to deal with that, but then also I had to let, okay, here's what they want to do. And everybody go, what? Okay, guys, give me something. Then I'd have to go back to Jeff and I'd say, okay, look, Jeff, for this reason, this reason, this reason, everybody thinks this is fucking crazy and we can't do this and here's why and here's what they want to do and here's what I suggested they change to and do you agree to that? And he'd say, yeah, do that. Then I'd go back, okay, and here we go, boom, 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 and then of course Russo would get hot, but see, here's the thing. Russo wrote the show, but he wouldn't have anything to do with the, the discussions of any of the matches or any of the physical angles, only the interviews. He would leave that to the agents. Well, that's you guys. I don't want to have anything to do with the matches, anything physical. That's what. That's your guys' specialty. But that's how the whole story Then why'd starts. you write the fucking shit? Because mm -hmm. now we got to fix your murder mystery. we got to figure out who did it after you've written the first chapter, mm -hmm. right? That's what. The, so that was a headache. 
Then there was one time, people searched this out um, on, on TNA Impact Wrestling. I don't remember the date, but it was when they had a, and I counted, a 32-man brawl going on in four different locations of the Impact Zone. In the ring, by the trailers, another place backstage, and I think the locker rooms. But four locations with a total of 32 talents were brawling all at the same time not even to go off the air at the top of the hour. <laughs> the show was from, from 9 to 11. This was at 10 o'clock. We had to come back from a 32-man brawl in four different locations to have another hour of the fucking program. Where I think then they went in the women's room. Mm. The women's room. They good. were fighting, the, fighting in the women's room. But So I took that as a personal goddamn challenge. Because Keith Mitchell's going, how the fuck are we going to shoot this? And Dave Sahadi's going, how am I going to direct it? And this wasn't a live show. This was just... With the resources they had and the places they had lit and the, the number of cameras they had and just anything that anybody who'd been around television production for like 30 fucking seconds would realize there were a number of problems with, he had just stroked his magic pen because Shakespeare must not be denied. So I said, okay, we'll goddamn set this thing up. So I figured out a way. I got 32 people together in four different locations. I set up furniture and toys and plunder for them to play with. I had them walk through everything they were going to do. I had the camera people. It, it took me the better part of three fucking hours for this four minutes of shit that was going to happen on the air. And we shot a 32-man brawl in four different locations, and everybody got the shots they were supposed to get, and, and then we came back from the top of the hour, and then the women were fighting in the women's room, and nobody remembered it five minutes after it fucking took place sure. because that's, you know, it was... It, 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 all it was was that show for the longest time until they started to gear him back a little bit was people basically just fighting and screaming at each other. They were fighting and screaming at each other in the ring, then they'd fight and scream at each other in the locker room, they'd fight and scream at each other out by the trailers, and then they'd fight and scream at each other in the bathroom. And at the end of the show, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, boy, for two hours, a bunch of people fought and screamed at me. <laughs> but the ratings were good then compared to now. Any that stand out in your mind, personal face-to-face -face interactions with Vince Russo based on this topic or that were fueled by your fed up I suppose. The last one. Yeah, of course. Because <laughs> that way we can, we can bring this topic hopefully to a close. Because <laughs> we still ain't off the no, first paragraph. Some more. But he, he, <laughs> oh, there's more. Oh, oh, yeah. but, <laughs> well, let, let, let me tell you. So, the uh, point being... It got to a point there for a while where it's just, it was so disheartening that here's this talent roster that wants to go, but they want to fucking feature the fucking Over the Hill gang, and the fucking TV people are ready to shoot this thing, but they don't have anything to shoot except nonsense, and a million and a half people are seeing it on Thursday nights, but it, it, it never, it's, that's what it is, a million and a half, mm -hmm. a one, mm -hmm. 1. 1.5 million people and whatever the 1.2 rating was at that time, just week after week after week, because apparently that is the amount of people at that time that were going to watch wrestling, no matter whether it's bad, good, indifferent, you know, fucking backwards, forwards, whatever. So for the last year, probably, I would just, I would go down there I would, you know, because the, the money was a consideration because they were giving me a nice check for what I was doing and I wasn't really doing anything else, didn't want to do anything else. Um, but at the same time, I, I have a defect. I can't quit something. In, in Pride is a terrible thing. <laughs> I can't quit until I just blow up and either it's forced on me or I just, I've, I'll go to prison unless I, if I see these people again or whatever. There has to be, because otherwise I can't quit. It, I will outlast this motherfucker sooner mm -hmm. or later. Sanity will prevail. Somehow we could turn this thing around. Somehow, blah, blah, blah. So, but the, but the last year, I would, go, I would go down. I'd shoot the shows. I would literally, I'd be on the phone with my wife. Back, I'd, I'd walk after the production meeting. I would go over to the, to the cafeteria, and I'd get a couple of cheesesteaks. Cheesesteak said, his name was Cedric. Cheesesteak said was the guy. He'd fix me up because he saw me there every, every day. And I'd eat a big cheesesteak with extra cheese, and I'd go call my wife, and I'd say 42 hours, which would be the length of time that I was either getting in the car to come home or would actually be home. And I would have it down to the hour because I was fucking miserable. And it wasn't going to get any better. There was no way to change this fucking thing as, as it existed. 
And then uh, the, the morning after the last taping, I would get up at 5 o'clock and I'd leave at 6 because that was the right time to leave to not hit any of the rush hour traffic because it was 860 miles nonstop back to Louisville, 862 to be precise. And I would make, I have made that drive in fucking 13 hours. Boom, from Orlando straight up through fucking North Florida, all the way up 75, get around Atlanta at the right time, Chattanooga, Nashville, and Louisville, right? And then I wouldn't think about wrestling or look at wrestling. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even watch the show. I'd seen enough of it, wow. you know, until the next time I went down there. So finally, I get down there the one time, and once again, dates blur, but it was the summer of 2009, warm weather at least, always warm in Orlando, but you know what I mean. And Dutch sees me at the hotel the night I get in. He said, well, shit's going on. What happened? That's when they sent Jeff home. Sent Jeff home because Jeff had been seeing Karen. I don't want to disparage anyone, and they're married now. So I guess that legitimizes it. But Jeff had been seeing Karen Angle, and Jeff had lied to Dixie about it and said, oh, no, that's not happening. And then Kurt had found out that it was happening, and Kurt said he's going to kill Jeff. And he was very capable of doing so. And, but Dixie, I guess, and I guess when your business partner tells you something that ain't true, well, then, you know, so anyway, so Jeff gets sent home. So now the only person with the ability that, in other words, I had the ability to go to Jeff and say, okay, here's what the guys want to do. Here's what I'd like to do. We're, we're going to get to the same place. We're going to take a different road because this is nonsense right. in the middle here. Now that's gone. Now we got no fearless leader. Who's going to break these ties? The guys that Russo wouldn't even come in the... Oh, and, and by the way, at that point, or shortly beforehand, Keith Mitchell and Dave Sahadi had gone to Jeff and asked that I be the only agent allowed in the TV truck. Because Savio Vega, a great talent, great wrestler, great guy, great agent... But his accent is so thick that on the fly, because the agent in the truck is saying, watch for the dive, and coming up, the finish is here, and watch this and that, so the director doesn't miss anything. Because even if it's on tape, a camera has to be on it. You can't take two in front of live people. Mm. Yeah. His accent was so <laughs> thick, shoot him, shoot him. They didn't know what the fuck Savio was saying, right? It was, it was throwing them into chaos. Dutch would sit in the truck. He would feed the announcers. Mike and Don, right? Mm -hmm. And and so and then Brian Armstrong. I love the Armstrong family. Bullet Bob, I admire. Brian was having issues then that we that he has spoken of himself and he hadn't gone to take care of those issues yet, so he was somewhat unreliable with some of the details. Okay. So they said we want Cornette to be the only agent in the truck. So not only did I now have to go through all this and agent my matches, but also I had to learn all the other agents' matches because I was there for the entire taping of the two-hour program. Every match, every dive, every out-of-the-ring spot, every crucial spot, we got to see this guy's expression, we got to see this guy pull the gimmick out, whatever. i got to tell him everything. And every once in a while, I'd have to run out <laughs> into the arena and actually do something on camera. And I I've, I've tried, kept trying to and pretty much finally succeeded to have them take me off of being on camera because that way I didn't have to wear the suit in that oppressive heat when I was running back and forth melting yes. on the bread, grilled cheese. Anyway, so now I'm the only agent in the truck. I'm the senior agent. I'm sometimes on camera to do something. They've sent Jeff home. Dutch is there to represent at, you know, wrestling, a wrestling person on creative, and Russo is there because he's writing the show. And I figure, okay, we have a good chance for anarchy to develop here because now without Jeff around, who are mm -hmm. they going to listen to? Russo refuses to have anything to do with the matches to the point where he wouldn't even come in the truck. But for the interviews, for the live interviews, I'd get him back because the, they'd say, okay, live interview view with Matt Stryker coming up. And everyone uh, would change the channel. Jim, well, what? what <laughs> Jim, what are they going to say? I don't have a clue. That's Russo. So then they'd have to find Russo because Russo was out in the building with the rest of the Marks watching the show. So they'd have to pull him into the truck where he'd then just watch the screen and see what happened and then fucking leave and wouldn't give him any direction or, or anything. And then I'd take back over. <laughs> so anyway, so now Jeff's gone. I believe I mentioned that a time or two. I do digress, as my mother used to say. 
So, what the fuck? So we got by with that first taping, and a lot of guys didn't want to do it, blah, blah, blah. Then Jeff calls me, one of the five times he called me while I worked for him for three years. And I'm paraphrasing, because this was a 30-minute conversation, and, and, but basically, Jeff Jarrett asked me, keep an eye on things. Keep an eye on my fucking company. And I should have known now I'm getting in the middle of this Peyton Place bullshit. Keep an eye on my company. You know he'll go too far if you let him. Yes, Jeff, I do. That's why I questioned you three years ago when you fucking hired him. And he'd do the Jarrett Tennessee two-step where he'd get around that. Don't let him go too far. Keep an eye out for the wrestling standpoint of things. In other words, don't let him mm -hmm. fucking just make the whole thing a goddamn laughing stock. Like it wasn't already. Keep an eye out for the wrestling side, but, you know, please try to work together. In other words, try to help my company, right, okay. while I'm not there. All right. Grandmother, I loved her. She was one of my mother's best friends. She started me in a business. Your father gave me my break. You've paid me well for three years. I will do the best I can. So I go down there, and I almost throw up a little in my mouth when I tell this story. I go down there, and, and, and also I talked to Terry Taylor, and they had me, they had me sending in, because Terry was head of talent relations now. Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, they had me sending in agent reports, and I had asked Terry, I said, do you, do you want the truth, or do you, do you want me to say what I think, or do you want me just happy talk? Who's going to see this? It's just for our inner circle, but you need to put it down. So if somebody was a pain in the ass, didn't want to mm -hmm. get together, didn't mm -hmm. want to do the job, mm -hmm. do the deal or do the job, write that. But if somebody was great and mm -hmm. really was going the extra mile of working hard, do that. Say what you think about the performances. Say what you think about the execution. How could it have been better? Whatever. So I was doing that. I'd sent the first one, and I was honest. Oh, boy. Without, no, I was honest. I wasn't motherfucking anybody's mother, right? I wasn't this fucking idiot, but I was saying... Either this guy didn't want to do this to begin with, so he tanked it, or this guy went above and beyond and made it better than it ever had the right to be, or these guys were stuck in an untenable position because they shouldn't have been involved in this match anyway because it didn't make any sense, and here's why. I would be honest. He write, that's exactly what we want. So I told Terry, I said, I need to have a meeting with Mr. Russo. You called for the meeting. Yes, no. I said you might want to. You might want to be there just yeah, so that the nobody, third party there. Of nobody course. misinterprets anything. Well, <clears throat> we get there at that taping, and Terry ain't around for some reason, and they're almost ready to sit down. And, and I don't want to hold up the production meeting, so I did. What the fuck? We're both grown adult men, right? So I call Russo over in the hallway. It's Vince. And we, we escalated after the first three or four months. It got to the point where we would say hello to each other when we came in the room, and then there would be the the wrestling handshake oh, where you sure, don't really you don't really mean it but it's like hello you know yes. whatever we never had a, a and we would talk about the the show or the subject at hand on what to do especially at the production meetings and i would sometimes ask him the tough questions as they do with the republicans and get the humana 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 when they don't know the answer but i didn't just we'd never had any crosswords there was no arguments there was no screaming fights there was no you fucking asshole this or that at least not on my part he probably was saying it once i found out later on he didn't like those agent reports because it called into his shit into question and it actually gave a uh, legitimate something that could have been done instead of those things so i called him over in the corner and i said look vince we've had a history this, this is not news but the team is in need our leader is fucking benched, and we could have anarchy around here, especially with some of the guys that they're paying an enormous amount of money to around here that don't want to do shit except cash your fucking check, and we need to work together. So I know I don't have your job. I don't want your job. I don't want to write this fucking thing, but I'm the one that has to lay it out and translate it for the, for the guys, whatever the fuck, so I will help you. Let's work together, right? We uh -huh. shake hands. Good. We do this. Terry Taylor comes around the corner. It's like, wow. did I miss the meeting I was supposed to be yeah. in? I said, no, it's all pleasant. I said, the team is in need. <clears throat> right? What did, what did it take for you to do that? What was it that drove you to say, you know what, man? Like you just said, the team need. Is it your passion? Is it your yes? Day? Because I couldn't. I didn't. It would be like leaving if you loved, you know, a, a parcel of small puppies, and you, you know, leave them with somebody that's going to mistreat them and not no. feed them, and you no, know, fucking can't. not care for okay. them. So okay, whatever. <laughs> this broke all of our hearts. So you okay. pressed flesh with your mortal enemy. <laughs> yeah. 
What happens then? I believe it was the very next taping. And I hate to go into so much detail. I do these things. One of the matches on the show, and it, I think it was, once again, it was coming up on Bound for Glory of 2009, but one of the matches on the show was Sting versus Hernandez. <coughs> That's what I think about that match. They were both baby faces, right? Hernandez was a, a project that, that Dixie believed in because Hernandez, I don't know if you know him or not, great guy. Always wanted to work hard, do his best. He got a late start. He's older than he looks, and he's older than people think he is. And he had worked for quite a while in Texas just for, you know, independent promotion where he, not, he didn't really get taught a lot. And then he'd been involved in LAX with Homicide, and, and he was the cleanup guy. Homicide is the guy that would sell and take bumps, and he was the big guy that would come in. So he was used to a tag team situation, but he'd never been featured on a main event level as a single but they needed a Hispanic baby face. Everybody needs Hispanic baby face these days, and, and for some reason, nobody can make one. So I <laughs> took it upon myself to try to do everything I could because he was such a nice guy and because there was a spot there for him. He could be a main event player. Strong, one of the strongest, Dr. Death Steve Williams Strong, wow. this fucking guy, right? And I've seen Doc do some amazing things, and Hernandez could be right up there with him. So I started laying out his matches Specifically, you know, it's some of the some of the little angles and you know, move for move, like where one time he was attacked by a bunch of heels, and the first one would dive in and he'd catch him in midair and power slam him, and he'd pop up just in time to take the other one and choke slam him, and he'd duck something and boot the other guy, and boom, and he'd dispatch a bunch of people, and he'd. The thing that nobody understands about ethnic baby faces anymore is that they got to be the guy. They can't be one of the guys. They got to be the guy. That's why everybody in, in, New, in New Orleans loved Junkyard Dog, because he was the guy. If he'd have been one of the guys, no, they wouldn't have been going, who dat talking about beating that dog, who dat, who dat. No, they wouldn't have. Same thing with Rey Mysterio. Unbelievable talent. A unique talent. A ratings mover, merchandise mover. He would almost get to be the guy, and they'd be ready, and then they'd pull it back. And I know he's had injuries, whatever. We're not, it's a day in court for the courts to decide another time. But, you know, an ethnic baby face has to be the guy. Can't be one of the guys. So you have to be very careful with Hernandez or, or with an African-American or anybody that you want to be an ethnic baby face hero spot. So, fucking genius. Books of match, Hernandez versus Sting. Sting, a babyface icon, right? But at the same time, Sting at the time was 51 years old, I guess. And also earlier in the program, the heels jumped him and he allegedly had two or three cracked ribs or broken ribs or whatever. So basically now what we're being asked to be led to believe is that a 50-something-year-old man, icon or not, can hang with a much younger moose of a, of a Hispanic baby face that outweighs him by 80 pounds. And not only that, but there's going to be run-ins. There always has to be run-ins, don't there? From all these other heels that are trying to fuck up their match. And then, because they, they sent me the notes on this, right? So that I could read it before I left the house. And then somehow... <laughs> that probably wasn't a good idea, because if you didn't well, like it, you wouldn't leave. Well, no, but then, then somehow... During all this multi-stage run-in and they turn around and they start fighting the heels together and then they turn back around and keep wrestling, but somewhere or another, Genius originally had Sting was going to, while Hernandez was distracted with the third wave of heel run-ins, was going to roll him up from behind. Or maybe it was Hernandez was going to roll Sting up. From, I don't know. One of the, the point is... One of the baby faces, I think it was Sting going to roll Hernandez up. Sting, a baby face, is going to roll Hernandez, a baby face, up from behind and beat him. Mm. And so the 50-something-year-old man with broken ribs just beat the goddamn... You see where this is going. Yes. So I, I left Russo a message. It's the only time we ever talked on the phone in three years. I said, call me. He called me on the way down. To, on, I was in the car. My wife was actually driving so I could talk because I was looking at these formats. I said, Vince, I said, for all these various reasons. Oh, and then that was the famous thing where somehow people thought of, I hated Eric Young because after the, this happened, this finish happened, Eric Young was going to come in with a baseball bat and lay both of them out and then stand over and cut a promo on them, right? So why don't you just piss in their mouth while they're down there, you know? 
Anyway, I, I talked to him on the phone. I said, Vince, for all these reasons, look, number one, all these guys are not going to be able to time these fucking run-ins just right. You know Hernandez is a project as a single. He's, still, he's getting his first push. Sting's supposed to have broken ribs. Where, how the fuck, Eric Young, a guy who, I love Eric. He's probably best athlete of the bunch of them. But he'd been used as an underneath comedy guy who when his pyro would go off, he'd take a bump every week for years and he never figured it out. And suddenly you put him in a suit and four weeks later he comes in with a baseball bat. He lays them both out, cuts a promo over them while they're laying there fucking selling. And by the way, both these guys are in main events at the pay-per-view coming up and Eric isn't even on the fucking card. No, let's, let's rethink this. Look, you're stuck on this match, right? Because you shouldn't have this match to begin with. I hope we've got to, because we've advertised it, because also it's points for the thing and the dude, the deal, and the tournament, and blah, blah, blah. I said, all right. I said, I'm, and, and as a matter of fact, I will go back to something that Vince Russo and I said to each other in 1997 at a Raw somewhere. 1998. On that Raw show in 1998, there were eight matches. Six, six of them were going to end in a disqualification, and then Helmsley went and bitched about China's match, so he got that changed to a DQ also, because that's when they were seeing each other. So I went up to Russo in the hallway, just quietly, like you and me. I said, Vince, I said, we got eight matches. We got seven DQs. And he pops up with the, you know, his accent, DQ, schmeek you. Nobody cares where everybody can hear him telling me this. So as he walks off down the hall, I said, you're going to be caring when you're back in three years running a goddamn video store, you fucking idiot. I was off by a year. He was back running the video store, but I was off by a year. So then he ran to fucking Vince McMahon and complained with Jim Cornette, just yelled at me in front of the boys. Of course, Vince goes to Jim Ross, says Cornette yelled at Russo in front of the boys. Ross comes to me. I said, here's why I yelled at him in front of the boys. I told him what the conversation was. He went back to Vince and said, yeah, I yelled at him in front of the boys. Here's why. He went back, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I said, let's do a DQ. Let's save face with mm -hmm. these guys. Jesus Christ. We always should have finishes, yes, but in this case, if you're sold on having Hernandez wrestle Sting and Sting's going to have these broken ribs, instead of this multi-phase run-in, who do you want to put the heat on? Let's have them run in try to disrupt the match. I can't even remember in some way or another. The guy, Hernandez got disqualified, a kind of a raw deal so Sting could advance, but nobody came up from behind anybody I said, and nobody came in and laid anybody out with a baseball bat and cut the price. I said, you can get heat on Eric Young later on. This ain't a fucking sprint. It's a marathon. In four weeks, that he ain't going to go from goddamn Festus the fucking hillbilly to goddamn Ric Flair. Okay. All right, good. And? Get to the production meeting. Look at the format. It's more gimmicked. He's gone back to the original finish, but it's more gimmicked up now. They've got somebody else running in first and doing something else. I said, what, what did we just spend all this time on the phone while I was in a car coming down here two days ago about? And that's even Taz jumped in. Taz said, well, we felt like we shouldn't have a DQ. I said, you shouldn't have the goddamn match. And now, once again, here's another thing my old Terry, friend Terry Taylor had told me. He said, when we're in our agents meeting, we need to be brutally honest. Leave it all on the table. But when we go out there, right. a united front. Sure. Okay, so we're in the fucking agents meeting right now. And Taz is there and Terry Taylor's there. And fucking, I guess, I think Keith Mitchell and Dave Sadi were in there because they're integral to the thing. And I'm there and Russo's there. And <clears throat> who else? I can't even remember. Uh, uh, they'd fired, they'd, oh, that's after they fired Dutch, by the way. Because then he called me and told me. Because, see, that's when Russo, once that Jeff was not there to contain things, Russo figured, okay, now I've got the chance. Because if everybody had just left me alone, I could have run this thing. And we'd all be doing four and five ratings. And we'd be selling out. So then Dutch was the next to go. Because he poisoned Dixie, you know, to Dutch. Because that's his M.O. And then, of course, Savio went with Dutch. So now, at this point, I was the last remaining holdout of fucking intelligence and sense. So, boy, oh boy. Exactly. And <laughs> Terry, you know, unfortunately, wasn't going to argue with anybody because he, you know, he and, besides he and Russo are Christian buddies, that's why I didn't trust Terry either because okay. they would ride together and they're both religious. Um, <clears throat> Terry didn't want to rock any boat because he was getting a check and, and that's fine. If, if, you can, if you can accomplish that, I, I, I've never been able to figure out how to do that. 
If you can accomplish that, if you can just take your check and, and not care what the fuck happens and not care whether it's a good job, bad job, indifferent job, and you don't want to say anything to rock the boat because you believe in something is right, if you, if you have that power, bless you, I've never been able to figure it out, can't do it. I try to be nice up until the time that nobody listens to me and then I, there eventually is the blow up. But anyway, so in the meeting, I said, God damn it, seriously. We agreed on this on the phone two days ago. You change it all back. You add shit. Taz even said we don't want to have a DQ. I said, shouldn't have the goddamn match. I said, but here, once again, here's why. And I laid everything out for everybody. And we changed it back. I didn't go into business for myself and go tell all these guys, just do fuck what they want, do this. We changed it back. In the agent's meeting, where we were supposed to hash everything out, leave everything on the table, we changed it back. It's going to be a DQ. We're going to stop all this run-in. No, Eric Young is not going to lay out two of the main eventers at the pay-per-view next month when he's not even on the card with a baseball bat and stand over them and cut a promo and kill fucking Hernandez and fucking damage Sting's reputation and whatever the fuck else was going to go on. We laid it out. We pulled it off on television. It wasn't as good as it something else would have been. But once again, when you're trying to polish a turd, sometimes it still stinks. We shouldn't have had the match to begin with. Did the taping the next day, and I got in the car and went home. Didn't hear from anybody for a week or so. And then, you know, I'm thinking, okay, my contract is coming up here in the next month or two, and I'm doing five times what I agreed to do to begin with and never asked for any more money. So I'm going to ask them for a raise for the first time since, since Jeff made me an agent. I hadn't, I'd never asked for any more money since that had been three years, right? So Terry Taylor calls me. It was a week before my birthday in 2009, so it was about three years ago. I said, hey, T.T., how you doing? He said, well, Jim, I got bad news. I thought somebody died. I said, what, 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 what happened? What's the matter? He said, we got to let you go. I started laughing. I said, well, I said, shit. I said, I was fixing to call you and ask you for a raise. I guess we're real far apart, aren't we? I said, what? Dixie believes you're not 100% behind creative. I said, that means I'm not 100% behind Russo, right? He said, well, yeah. I said, this is a news bulletin? When the fuck did this become news? No, I think he's a fucking idiot. But you know that just last, last month or two weeks ago or whatever, I actually told him I'd help him. I'm more on his side now than I ever have been. But no, if you ask me my true opinion, I think he's a fucking idiot. And he's fucked his whole fucking company up. But how has that affected the job that I've been doing for the last three years? Well, it just, I said, what's, what's he said? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with him. It's just she feels so suddenly after all this time without even having a conversation with her, and suddenly after all this time of doing actually more work instead of less work than I was actually intended to do, and suddenly after all this time, Something now, well, suddenly it's because Jeff ain't there and Dutch ain't there to fucking keep an eye on him, and she's the only person he's listening to, or she he's the only person she's listening to, and that's his talent is, for some reason, he can't do anything else right, but he can make people believe that don't know any better that he knows what the fuck he's talking about, and he's a genius at that. So anyway, I said, have Dixie call me. So the next morning, she calls me, and Terry's on the phone. And it, it, that's when I said, once again, okay, Dixie, just tell me. And I mean, once again, this was a 30-minute conversation, and I can't remember the words, the exact words that she used because it didn't make any sense, and also because I've tuned it out since then, like PTSD. But she's, well, Jim, if everybody's not on the team 100%, we want to hit a home run. And if everybody's not swinging as hard as they can and all this, I think she learned that in school when she went to the finishing school for fucking Southern Bells or whatever. This is the way you talk in PR speak or whatever. But I said, Dixie, just tell me. Just tell me flat out that Russo has talked you into fucking firing me, and that's, that's fine. Because I know, oh, it doesn't have anything to do with Miss Russo. Said, well, you see how I find it hard to believe? Because every time this happens, generally I get a phone call, and it's something because I've had a problem with him. So, you know. No, it just... if. Jim, the door is always open to you to come back, and you're always on, you know, if you could just get 100% behind it. I said, well, if you don't think, since I've been the first one there at a production meeting, I drive, and I'm the first one there. I'm the last one to fucking leave. I've fucking done this and that and the other thing. If you don't think I'm behind your company, okay, fine. But I know it's Russo, so I just wish you wouldn't be that way. But mm -hmm. all right. So And there wasn't even any yelling there. And, of course, Terry 
once again, wouldn't... Sp well, Jim, you know, you've said many times that he's, a, you know, he's like, like he's feeding her reasons, right? Yes, I've said many times he's a cancer and he's this and that and the other thing. I said, but you said we were supposed to hash all that out in the room. Anyway, nevertheless, the next day, I get on the internet and there's a big thing that says, Jim Cornette fired for big blow up with Vince Russo being unprofessional, screaming, why are you trying to push Eric Young and all this other shit? What the fuck TNA source says, right? So I called Terry Taylor. I said, Terry, so what the fuck is it? Yeah, I wish we knew where this was coming from. We've got a leak here somewhere. I said, well, I wish I knew where it came from because it didn't fucking happen. And you were in the room and the only people that would know about the Eric Young thing and et cetera, et cetera, were in that fucking room. And I, I may speak loudly as I am now, but I'm not screaming at you and I'm not calling you a motherfucker, but I am blah, blah, blah. And I said, here's another thing, Tell. Oh, this was the line I said when he was talking about. Well, you know, that finish with Hernandez and Sting. I said, we changed it. Well, yes, but, but uh, I said, no, we changed it in the meeting. We changed the finish. Well, Jim, it's just that sometimes you're so forceful, people don't want to disagree with you. <laughs> So you mean to tell me that you're mad at me because of a finish that we changed in a meeting. Not that I went into business for myself, not that I told him to do some more shit, but a finish that we changed in the meeting and now you're mad at me and want to fire me because we changed the finish when all of us agreed to change it because nobody had the balls or the dick to stand up and say, well, fuck you, that ain't any good. You know why they didn't? Because it wasn't. It wasn't the shits. It was good. It was the best we could do under the circumstances, Terry. Now I'm getting slandered by somebody in that fucking room. Wonder who that could be. Mm -hmm. And I want a goddamn retraction from TNA. Because I, I, we had agreed. I said, okay, I ain't going to knock you guys. You pick Russo, it's fine. Because if she's that fucking stupid, that she's going to stick with that fucking guy. As Lance Storm said one time, trading Jim Cornette for fucking Ed Ferrara, who will come up in a minute, is like trading your house for a tent. If she wants to pick Vince Russo over me, and that's her father's money, not hers, her father's money. He made $2 million profit off of bull cum, by the way, a few years ago. He owns those thoroughbred bulls, and they yeah. take their cum and breed the other bulls. How he, do I get into that business? He made, well, you'd be, have to be the one to milk them, though. <laughs> oh, so okay. that wouldn't, okay. That's not the prime job. Sorry. But, you know, anyway, so... <laughs> Things you will only hear on our shoot video. If she wants to fucking... Trust her company to Vince Russo instead of me, that's fine, but I, I don't like being lied about. I don't like being lied to. I've already been lied to, I know, and now I'm being lied about. So what are you going to do about it? I'm going to get with Dixie, Terry Taylor says, and we're going to issue a retraction and make sure this is all cleared up. Sure enough, I look on the Internet the next day, and a TNA source says it wasn't true. That <laughs> Wait was a minute, retraction. that was the retraction. And I swear to God, Terry Taylor, I could, even, I could show you the email, but he, he says... He sends me an email says, is this what you were looking for? I sent him an email back. I said, no, it's not what I was looking for. Some fucking unnamed source that was only one of seven or eight of us in the room. And guess who that could be? Because everybody besides, and they hired that Matt Conway. So Because Russo always has to have somebody carry his papers, right? And actually, they hired Matt Conway on the TNA creative team because Dixie wasn't hearing what was going on in the creative meetings. So she hired, he was a production intern or whatever. And they put her, she put him on the creative team so she could have a stooge to tell her what was going on, what they were saying about her. Because, you know, we're all in high school. So, so anyway, I said, no, that wasn't what I was looking for. I was looking for a retraction with Dixie Carter's name on it saying, no, none of this ever took place, what was reported in your goddamn column, and, and uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. I said, so now I guess I'll have to defend myself. And that's when I started telling people what the fuck really happened. Because once again, not only, <laughs> they, they had to poke me with the stick. Not only, and, oh, and then three days later is when they announced Ed Ferrara is going to be, because Russo has to have somebody carrying his papers around, because mm -hmm. it makes him look important. When, you, when, you, when you're walking around and you've got somebody behind you carrying papers, you can say page four, and they hand it to you, it makes you look important. So then Ed Ferrara comes on to be the agent, because apparently he sold them the idea, sold Dixie the idea. Well, Cornette keeps changing my creative, and if only my vision could get out there unencumbered, then our ratings would go up and our business would go up. How'd that work out for you? Sarah Palin won She's the Sarah Palin of wrestling, Dixie Carter. <laughs> she can see bankruptcy from her house. So anyway, so they hire Ed Ferrara, and of course he wasn't going to fucking come into the building that I was in, mm. It, 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 I had to be gone first, and sure. somehow he convinced 
Russo convinced Dixie, yeah, if I get Ed Ferrara, because we did such, we worked such magic for WCW, that, uh, you know, all will be, we'll be right as rain. So immediately I knew, okay, she lied to me. She knew Ferrara was coming in. She knew the Russo talked her into. She lied to me, not to my face, but to me over the phone. And then she had her stooges lie about me. And then she wouldn't even put her name on the retraction. So that's when I started telling everybody what I thought about it. And I'll tell you the story of the first time I met Don West real yes. quick. And then I'll, I'll tell you the, finally the punchline and we'll get out of this. Jesus Christ, after however long it's been on TNA. It could be the TNA spectacular. Uh, I'll tell you the last... Uh, interaction I've had with TNA, but the first time I met Don West, I didn't know I met Don West because Burt Prentice, my old friend, was running Nashville at the fairgrounds, and he had TV on locally, and he asked me and Scott Hudson to cut, to do his TV commentary, and all I had to do was drive down from Louisville, and I, you know, I like Scott, and I like Burt, and be glad to help out in my old days in Nashville, blah, 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 do his shows a number of occasions, and then one day he called me, this was 2002, and he called me and he said, well, he said, you know, Jerry Jarrett's starting a company. I said, well, that's, that's what I hear. It's, you know, good for them guys. And Well, he's got his announcers coming because they, they need some practice before they start doing their show. And I thought he was telling me, well, so I'm going to use them instead of you guys. And I was, that's fine, mm -hmm. Bert. I'm just, you know, I've got plenty to do with OVW. I'm just guest starring for you. I'll be glad to back, back out. And he said, no, no. I want you to do my show. They're just going to be over in the corner practicing. They're just putting it on tape, but it's not really going to air. But I wanted to tell you that one of them's Ed Ferrara. And I said, oh, I'm going to have to knock him the fuck out. He said, that's why I'm calling you. I please, please don't. Please don't. don't. Yeah, please don't hit him. Okay. And we had the conversation. And, and I don't know if you know this or not, but the reason why I despised Ed Ferrara, not only because he's butt buddies with Vince Russo, but also because he did the Oklahoma thing, mocking Jim Ross's Bell's mm -hmm. Palsy. Uh, Mr. Producer, did I tell the, the Ferrara yep. Nashville story on okay on a previous so on a previous episode, which I'm sure you can still find available the RF video. But anyway, short story. Bert talks me into not fucking hitting him, right? But when I was standing there talking to some of the other boys, and he came up to me with his goddamn goofy looking fucking dreadlocks. Here's a white middle aged frumpy fat guy that suddenly got dreadlocks. And sticks his fucking hand out. I told him what I thought of him in no uncertain terms. And much as the who's down in Whoville, it started out low, but it continued to grow as I got madder about you fucking piece of shit. You don't have any goddamn respect for the business or anybody in it. You made mockery of a guy that's fucking has more talent in his little finger than you have in your whole fat fucking pudgy body. That a, a fucking illness almost ended his professional career, and you want to make fun out of it just because you fucking don't like him. Fuck you. I told Burt Prentice I wouldn't fucking hit you, but I didn't say it. I wouldn't fucking fight you, so there's the goddamn door. If you want to go out back, we can fucking both fight, and then I spit in his fucking eye. And then people got in between us and everything, and he's wiping it out. And then Don West <laughs> was his broadcast partner that night. Oh. He, Don West was over in the corner. That's the first time he ever saw me in person. He didn't tell me the story until years later, That's right? Great. And he said... I was so fucking scared, and I didn't want to talk to you. And he said, and he said Ferrara was shaking the rest of the night. He was so scared. They even broke down early and fucking took off so that he wouldn't have to cross my path. And he said, and now that I meet you, you're such a cool guy. Because me and Tanae and Wes, we'd hang out after the production meetings. We'd do tr music trivia, blah, blah, blah. Oh, nice. He said, I met you. You're such a cool guy now, and you're so much fun and blah, blah, blah. But I thought, holy shit, that's the first time I met Don West. So you see, the first time I meet people, for some reason, <laughs> this there's is always... always